Hey, it's Scott. Welcome back to Spin Magazine's Live Service. My next guest is a singer-songwriter that's been making music for over 20 years. Music for the Morning After, his debut is one of my favorite records of all time. He is Pete Yorn. I think you're going to enjoy this episode. Pete's a great guy with some great stories. He'll talk about Killers of the Flower Moon, his cameo in that movie, his new music, and everything under the sun. Coming up in just a moment, Mr. Pete Yorn. <laughs> Welcome me to the show, one of my favorite singer-songwriters of all time, Mr. Pete Yorn. Good to see you again, my brother. Great to see you, dude. Thank you for yeah. that. Yeah. Thank you. It's great to have you. I know you, we did this before. I think it was like four or five years ago. We were just catching up. My dog was like the size of my hand, and now he's like... Uh, a good, I don't know, I'm going to put him at about 12 pounds now, so it's... I feel like that was like the first day you had the dog. Yeah, I, just had, I think I had only had him at that point for like two months, Milo, so shout out to the greatest oh, dog wow. in the world, but uh, it's been a good been a good last five years. You're so prolific, you're always putting out records. I think this is your 10th record you put out not long ago, and now you just, someday, someday, you just performed this morning yep. on Good Morning America. We were talking about it because it comes out in the afternoon, so it's a bit confusing, but uh, it went great. Yeah, I think it was a good one. Yeah, yeah, it's uh, it's exciting. It's amazing. So you and I know last night you performed in Brooklyn, and you're doing uh, mostly acoustic stuff now, right? Or are you doing sometimes you have like the band with you? What do you prefer at this point? Uh, both. You know, um, the new song is very stripped back, so it, it lends itself to the acoustic guitar. I had a piano player with me last night, and uh, had another buddy singing some backing vocals. But um, yeah, it's nice to play both ways, band, acoustic, either way. I like. Well, there's so much to get into, and I was talking to you outside a little bit before what we got into last time. But take me back to the beginning. One of the things I love about you is that we we share a love of hair metal. And uh, I know early on when you were starting to get into music at a, like a kid, you know, you were into Priest and Maiden, things like that. I think the first record you bought, do you remember what that was? Rat Out of the Cellar. Which is amazing because just to show you my love of that music, I just went to see them, and they performed that record in its entirety just about a month ago in L.A. You saw Rat or Steve Piercy? I saw Steve Piercy, but you my know, boy's it's... the drummer. My old drummer is Scott Coogan. Oh, really? He's the drummer for Steve Piercy. <laughs> yeah, well, and you know, he's really. It's one of those bands, as you know, where there was like three versions of the band at some point. You're like Bobby Blotcher's Rad, and then Steve because none of those guys get along anymore. But um, it was great to hear those songs and to hear that record in its entirety. They're good tunes, and those those guys play it well. Like they, they do. like. It's very, very metal, and it's very, like, you know, it's a lot of great songs that, from that era that hold up, and they're classics, and if you if you like that stuff, and there's a lot of crap, too, but the good ones are classics. Yeah. They're amazing. Talk yeah. to me about your first earliest memories, like listening to music and getting into that kind of music back when you were a kid and your brother started to teach you how to play drums back in the day. Yeah, you know, I grew up in suburban Jersey, and, you know, my first influences that really little were, you know, probably the stuff my parents were playing around the house, like Burt Bacharach, Carpenters, Barry Manilow. And, uh, and then I started, you know, my brothers, my middle brother is six years older than me and my oldest brother is nine years older. And when they started to develop and I started paying attention, I noticed or listening to like Blue Oyster Cult, Michael Shanker group, you know, uh, Scorpions, <laughs> um, and then of course Iron Maiden and Judas Priest. And that's what really, you know, caught my ear and I got really excited about Maiden and Priest. And we first got MTV, you know, in probably 81, 82 maybe, you know, in, in our little town. We had to, to get a cable box, you know, kind of like switches and the buttons on it. And that's when we were able to get MTV when it first started. And uh, I remember seeing, you know, those videos for like, you know, uh, I remember seeing the Trooper video. Uh, I remember seeing, you know, Breaking the Law and stuff like that. And I was just, I remember very vividly sitting in the basement, like just watching MTV and saying, please play a Juice Priest video. Please play, <laughs> you know, play a Juice Priest video. Like loved it so much. And uh, yeah, that's where it started. And I started playing drums when I was nine. My brother Rick taught me how to play. He just showed me a beat and then I had it. It was something that was really just natural I could just do. And I remember they were really, they'll still tell the story of how they were like, you know, one day they came home and they heard like someone going off on the drums in the basement. Like, who is that? And it was like this little Petey back there. Like, <laughs> I was like sitting on phone books back there and like I had long legs uh, trying to get above the above the, the tom so I could play on a bigger set. And he doing, was a doing writing. Dance the Night Away, by the way. It right? was Dance the Night Away. <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> yeah. And then <laughs> um, I, you know, 
after that though, I remember all that music I loved so much, but I never like wanted to dress like them or look like them and anything. And then all of a sudden maybe puberty started hitting and it hit early for me. It definitely like chemically it did hit, hit very early for me, but something changed and I was like, and I got introduced to, as that was happening. I got introduced to the Smiths and the Cure and all this stuff. And and all of a sudden, I was like, went from wanting to just like play drums to these songs. Like, oh wow, I want to want to write, try and write a song like this. You know, hearing "In Between Days" by the Cure. I was like, oh, I want to write a song like that. And I remember uh, hearing "Big Mouth Strikes Again" too by the Smiths, and that sort of percussive strumming. You know, nanning and nanning and nanning and nanning. You know, that thing I think was a natural step for me thinking about it now from drums and playing so rhythmically. Uh, I was like, I want to write songs that have a percussive feel like that. So I would, I would write these like big strummy songs and uh, just for fun. And then that's where I started writing music after hearing bands like that. But then also, man, Poison, Every Rose Has Its Thorn. Here's a simple acoustic song. And I was like, fun to learn that. Same time I was trying to learn Big Mouth Strikes again, I was learning Every Rose Has Its Thorn, you know, and that, that was the way it was. I didn't, I wasn't like... Oh, this or that. I kind of loved all that stuff, you know? And your mom and dad were supportive of this venture into music for you, or did they just think at a certain point this is just a pastime for you? I thought they were supportive of music in the house. They never thought I'd do it for a career, and I never thought <laughs> right. I would either. It wasn't, you know, um, you know, once I was older, when push came to shove, it was, you know, I was in a fortunate position where I was able to move out to California after college and live with my brothers, and they were already kind of established where if they want to just kind of overrule my parents and say, well, Petey's with us now, that's that, you know? And so, you know, my parents, when I, when I decided I was going to try and do music and my parents were like, why is he going to do music? I went to, you know, he's supposed to be a tax lawyer. What is this? You know, <laughs> my brothers were like, no, he's good. And he's going to, he's going to make it. And they were so supportive and they gave me belief more belief than I had in myself I mean I had that like young kind of like you know you see people do it like I could do that you know I could do it better than that whatever but I wasn't you know certain and you know I just kept at it I was lucky to be able to keep at it until till uh we were able to break through a little bit how old were you when you moved to LA were you 13 I or moved 14? out right after college so oh, okay. I graduated at Syracuse in 96 April and I moved out in May 96. And at that point, we were like, I'm going to be a musician. I'm going to go to LA. I'm going to give it whatever 100%. it takes. I thought I'd go out. I thought I was going to get a record deal right away. I didn't know how anything worked, but I had a lot of songs I had been writing. And I was like, you know, I was like, you know, I had that young bravado, you know, and it was good. You got to have some of that. You got to be a little bit uh, confident in yourself. Um, Do you remember the first song you wrote? The first song I wrote was called The One. And I remember it very vividly. I was trying to write like a Cure song. And I was like, she was the princess of the underworld. Her lips were red like fire. She told me once or so I thought love was her desire. And I think I sang it with a British accent. <laughs> and I, I remember at a certain point I was like, oh, I rhyme fire and desire. I can't do that. And then there's tons of pop hits that do that. But I remember beating myself up about it later. But it's a fun song. It has a cool melody. And uh, yeah, there's a lot of songs that I wrote when I was like 13, 14 that I still remember very well. Because after the phase, and people forget in like mid 80s to late 80s, it was all about the hair metal. But after that phase, you got into, you know, The Cure and The Smiths and yeah, I all never the British wrote, bands. I never wrote anything where I was trying to emulate, you know, the hair metal. That never inspired me to write. It was The Smiths and The Cure and R.E.M. I have to yeah. shout out for sure. Those, those were the bands that made me want to write. And later on, you ended up touring with R.E.M. So it's a great yes. story, right? Which you probably never thought that would happen. No, that was, you know, one of those unbelievable. Dream come true, right? Yeah, dream come true for, for my whole family. Me, we, we, we went out, we went, we toured Europe with them. My brother, Rick, who turned me on to RM, he played me boxcars, Carnival of Swords in his car in my driveway. And I remember I'd never heard anything like it because if you listen to that song, it's on the um, Chronic Town EP. If you listen to that song, it starts off. And I think that inspired how Music for the Morning After starts. Well, I'll tell you. He goes, Petey, I want you to hear this song. We get in my parents' car and we're sitting in my driveway and he turns it up really loud and it's kind of this carnival music and it's kind of muffled and it's quiet. And then all of a sudden the band just kicks in, boom, 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 boom. And it jumps like a good five, six dBs. And I was like, whoa, I never heard anything yeah. like that before. And I thought it was such a cool way to start a song and just, you know, just 
get your attention. And I think when we did Life on the Chain, how it starts all kind of, yeah, it's you like know, a transistor radio. Yeah, kind of that. And then it kicks in yeah. for like full spectrum. I think that was one of the things I was thinking about for sure. Our show today is brought to you by the fine folks at Sonos. I have to take a moment to talk to you about my favorite speakers on the planet. First impressions, open up the box, some of the sleekest speakers I've ever seen in my life. Sonos has hands down been my favorite speaker brand for years, especially as a touring musician myself. I've used all types of speakers throughout my career, and I gotta tell you, Sonos beats them all for sound quality and ease of use. I recently got the Beam sound bar and the extra subwoofer, plugged it in, super easy to use, and I gotta tell you, my room fills up with sound like no one's business. The Beam sound bar is the clearest dialogue, such insane bass, especially when hooked up to my extra subwoofer. My homeroom shakes. It literally fills up my bedroom with so much sound. Lately, I've also been using the Arc soundbar for my living room TV. It's super easy to connect to. I was able to seamlessly hook it up. It's sleek and it blends right into my space. The Arc soundbar has really changed the way that I watch TV and movies. I'll have some friends over, I'll hook it up to the extra subwoofer, and it really helps to create that intense surround sound. The design is immaculate. It looks great below my TV in my living room. And my favorite thing about Sonos speakers is how easy they are to use. You can set them up in under 20 minutes or so. The sound's incredible, they look incredible, and they are the best gift you can buy for anyone. Head over to Sonos.com to learn more and find gifts for every listener on your list. So talk to me about that. You moved to L.A. There was the, Early on, it was those Cafe Largo days. And if people aren't aware of that scene back then, you had you know, Elliot Smith and a lot of the greatest songwriters at that point. They just would like hop on stage and you know, play acoustically. So that was an incredible time to be in L.A. and just start to kind of, you know, work on your chops and things like that. But it took you a while. It took you like three or four years to really get a deal. Yeah. And that story leading up to your deal is actually pretty interesting. We were chatting about a minute ago about Life on a Chain, and you had a meeting with Columbia Records the day before in that song, which I was telling you, that is a desert island disc to me. Your first record is still one of the greatest debut records of all time. I, mean, I listen to that record religiously. And I think we spoke about it last time too. But talk to me about the Cafe Largo days leading up to the point where you got your deal. Because it took about, as I said, three or four years. Yeah. So when I first moved to LA in 96, I had, I quickly made some demos, like a six song demo at this studio called Cherokee. Um, that was on Fairfax. It's not there anymore. Sure. The Rob brothers had that place. It's a cool spot. And, uh, and I had the songs on there and a friend of mine from college was Adam Cohen, whose dad was Leonard Cohen. And, uh, he, and at the time, I didn't even know who Leonard Cohen was. He was just my friend. I, I really was so clueless. I had no <laughs> idea. Leonard. I was like, <laughs> now I'm like, oh my God. Was, you know. But um, he uh, he was nice enough. He knew Flanagan at Largo, who like, Flanagan runs Largo and still does, and uh, best guy. And he slipped him my little demo thing, and Flanny just got it right away. He's, he's like, we're going to give Pete a night. We're going to give him, we're going to get him in there. So he got me in and ever since then, back in 96, 97, whenever that was, he's been supportive of my music and always would get me in. Uh, and um, what I didn't realize was like what I was stepping into at that place, which was, you know, you walk in, it's like Amy Mann's in there, Elliot Smith's in there, uh, Maybe there was Rick a, Rubin or whoever. Right? There was like just a, of, a scene. Yeah. Early, early, I would see on the thing, like, who is this Tenacious D? Like, early, <laughs> before, you know, he messed, you know, yeah. like, before the, way before the HBO show, you know, because um, there would be this comedy kind of thing going on there, too. And now at the theater where they have it uh, on, uh, at the Coronet Theater on La Cienica, it's Largo has become very comedy driven. It's mostly comedy, I would say, even more. I mean, there's music still, but it's like mostly comedy these days and some unbelievable performers. But um, yeah, they, you know, they welcome me. And I always felt like an outsider in there. I always felt like I'd walk in and like you could hear a pin drop. Everyone was like so silent. It was like it was like a little pub back yeah. then, you know. It wasn't a rowdy club. No, no, no. And everyone was just <laughs> silent and really there for the music and and focused. And I'd be like walking in and I'd be like make a like drop some, I'd be like, Ugh, you know, and when I would have a show there, I'd all, a lot of my friends from college moved out to California. So they, and they were all rowdy and they would come see me play and they would all be at the bar, just clanking, getting all rowdy, <laughs> talking through my whole set. And I didn't care, but it was like a whole different vibe when I would play. Peter, and, play the one. Yeah. <laughs> and I remember, <laughs> play Velcro shoes. And I remember like, you know, like, wow, like, 
like uh, I thought it was really cool how like certain performers in there could really just captivate an audience and like just just hold attention in that way. And I thought not that I like I didn't aspire to like that I had to do that, but I thought it was a cool thing to be able to do if you wanted to. And um, and and uh, yeah, that's fun. Was uh, your brother playing drums for you at that point? Or had he did play drums. I played there sometimes acoustic and sometimes with a band. Um, I even had like a, I had a, we had a band called Showbud named after the pedal steel um, guitar that one of the, the uh, musicians in the band used. But um, we had a lot of good little shows there. And I met Paul McCartney, I remember, in the, in the kitchen there. And Flanagan slipped them music for the morning after. Amazing. And Flanagan always tells me a story. He goes, he goes, he goes, McCarty said, he goes, I'm not going to do his accent or try, but he goes, strange condition. That's a song. That's a song. And that's I was always amazing. like, I don't know what he means, but it, I think, I think he did. I think he liked it. Yeah. Amazing. Well, yeah. So it's funny because your brother, we, we spoke about a little bit, went on to become one of the biggest managers in all of the business. He just actually did Killers of the Flower Moon, which you had a little part in. Uh, yeah. And it's interesting because I feel like I know you kind of well. We've never spent a lot of time together, but you know, we have so many mutual friends and I saw the movie and I remember thinking, this guy looks familiar. But to be honest with you, it didn't, there's so many cameos in that movie. It was like Jason Isabel and, and uh, Jack White had a cameo. Martin Scorsese had a cameo. But I, I guess I didn't even realize when I was watching it that it was you. So what was that like? Because you had to cut your hair and you really couldn't tell people about doing that movie for a while until it came out recently. Yeah, it was, they had it was Sturgill Simpsons in it and Charlie Musselwhite and a bunch of like I think when they were deciding casting they want they decided they wanted some musicians to play some of the outlaws is a story I got and uh, you know I was on their radar you know I had Marty something about like I wanted something about my face a weird face you know and I had read for this was like when the full on like pandemic quarantine lockdown was going on, I get an email like, yeah, they want you to, to read over Zoom for this, you know, a couple of these Small parts. Movie, that's... And, and I was like, well, come on. I'm like, all right, what else am I doing? I'm sitting around scrubbing toilets and, you know, washing <laughs> groceries uh, separating in the desert. My, separating my groceries yeah, and wiping them down. It was literally during that time. And I was living in the desert hiding out at that time. And so I was like, all right, what else I got to do? I do it. And I, when I read the lines, I was like, I initially read for a different part and I was like, it's kind of fun. You know, I was like surprised at how I was able to memorize everything really easy. And it was fun. To also, I was like, I just, my, right away, my, I just kind of felt like I could play one of these guys, you know? And, uh, you know, I read with this great casting agent named, um, Ellen Lewis and she was so nice. And, uh, yeah, I read for one part, and then they said, "Okay, well, we'll we'll get back to you." And then like a few weeks by, a few weeks went by, and I totally forgot about it to be honest. And then all of a sudden they hit me again, they're like, "Okay, they're sending you more lines. They want you to read again." And I'm like, "Okay, whatever." And then like uh, read again, and they said, "Okay, we'll get back to you." And then I don't know how much time went by at that point. I think things were slowing down because of the pandemic, the whole schedule of it all. And uh, then they hit me again. They were like okay, why don't you read one more time for this? And I was like, and then I was like, okay. And then forgot about it. And I remember like not letting myself get too even excited about it because the whole thing seemed kind of pie in the sky to me, to be honest. And I was like, is it really going to happen? And then all of a sudden I get a voicemail like, Pete, it's Ellen Lewis. Congratulations. You got the role of AC Kirby. And I was like, what? And I was like, all right. And then uh, I was like, okay. But I still was just like, well, I'm not telling anyone because I'm going to end up on the cutting room floor, <laughs> even if it happens. And and so we didn't shoot for like eight months after that. I drove. We took a road trip to Oklahoma, me, my wife, and my little girl, B. And we drove. We made a little fun trip about it. We stopped at different places. And then... You know, I shot two of my scenes and then went home and then I had to go back again in the September in the fall and shoot a few more scenes. They added some more scenes with me. And uh, I did a scene with De Niro. That was surreal. Mm -hmm. I'm like, what the heck's going on? You know, um, <laughs> I was going to say, when well, you've never acted before and you're working with Martin Scorsese and De Niro and I don't I guess Leo was like looking for you in the movie a lot, but you never really I don't think you were opposite him in any scene there were you. We were never in a scene together, but I did I did spend an afternoon with him out there on a day off and uh, he took me took me and my daughter to this really cool park in Tulsa and he was so great. He was like he's like Pete, 
you want to run your lines or whatever? And I was like, sure, <laughs> let's do it. And so uh, I just, I'm, I didn't have many lines, but I just showed him, like, I'm thinking of just doing it like this. And I showed him how I was going to do it. And he was just like, perfect. That's perfect. Do it just like that. <laughs> and I was like, okay. And Marty pretty much said the same thing. I did, to be honest, I did everything in like two, one, two takes. And Marty would come in and he'd be like, great, Pete, great. Got it. And I'd be like, is he just saying that? I was like worried that maybe he was just kind of like, all right, these kids sucks. But I think they got it. And I, you know, I saw the movie and I'm very happy with the way that they were able to put me across. I'm glad I didn't ruin yeah. the movie for them, but <laughs> you, definitely uh, you know, I feel like it was just an honor to be part of that thing as a story and just, you know, be with such talented people. And did you ever feel inclined to like hit your brother up and say, how am I looking on this part? Do you think I might get it? Or because he's obviously, he was an executive. Producer Even when they said, you know, like ob obviously I just want the movie to be great. Right. You know, I don't want to be like shoehorned into anything <laughs> yeah. and like, you know, it's not about that. And I never had that as, you know, ambition anyway, you yeah. know, it was so, I was never like, get me in a movie or it was not that sort of thing thing. So to, you know, to have it happen, like I said, I was always telling my boy Dan over there, like, I'm going to believe it until I see it on the screen because I can end up on the cutting room floor. And so I told nobody. And then it was when the strike was going on, I couldn't even promote it at the time either. And uh, it was just funny. So I had so many friends be like, I was like, there's Petey. Is that Pete in that movie? <laughs> and uh, it was funny. And it was a big change because I had my full pandemic hair. My hair was literally down yeah. to here. I think I posted a video on Instagram like fast where, or, or a split where my before and after. And I had the longest hair I ever had to the shortest hair I've had since I've been a baby probably. <laughs> uh in one day, and uh, it was kind of liberating to cut my hair off. I still, I've kept it kind of short since then. But, if you uh, only do a couple of movies and you keep working more with Scorsese and De Niro and people like that, you're good. I mean, you only need to work with the greats. I said, <laughs> I know. So they're, people, my, they're like, P, you want to do more stuff? And I'm like, I'm like, well, you know, the right right person calls. You know, <laughs> you'll, you'll I'll consider it. I'll consider yeah. it. Well, take you know. me back again for a moment. I just wanted to talk about, again, after Largo, because we digress a little bit, but after Largo, <laughs> you end up getting this deal. And the story behind you having a meeting with Columbia Records, not having one of your greatest songs. We were just talking about Life on a Chain. Still one of my favorite songs. Um, and I put that song on all the time. It's just a great, I don't know, one of the great songs. You missed it. I played it last night. You missed it. I, I know. But, you know, I will be <laughs> back to see you. So, um, But talk to me about that story because you didn't actually have that sort of written when you went to go meet with your a &R guy at Columbia, when there, were, there was interest for a deal for you, but you didn't have that yeah. song written. What happened was I was playing around L.A., uh, you know, from like 96, 98. And, you know, it was I was getting better. I was developing, you know, but I, I M MCA had made an offer, but I was advised not to do it. Uh, this really nice guy, Michael Rosenblatt, who 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 really liked what we were doing, but the deal just didn't sound like it was right. It was like it was it was like maybe not the right deal, and so we didn't do that. And then uh, and then I had made some uh, I made a record with Don Fleming, who actually produced that record, shirt you're wearing right now yeah. uh, in New York City, um, and it turned out beautiful. And I was kind of shopping that around. And uh, Simon Eyes from Music Form After was actually on that. Like that record sounds like Simon Eyes. Every it's just the whole thing. Sure. Uh, um, and we were shopping around, and I remember Virgin or some some entity within Virgin. They loved it, and they wanted to sign me. And they said something to me at dinner. We meet for dinner, and they're like, "We want to sign you." And they said, "But we don't. We want you to change the second half of the album." And I. If I didn't like that. I said I was so like, like young and like you know you that didn't like it. See you later. That young naivete, <laughs> uh, 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 too too sure of himself. And I was drunk. I drank like a whole bottle of wine at the dinner. I said, well, if you don't like that part, and it really was my favorite part of the record, the back end of that record. If you don't like that, and you're not going to get me moving forward, so it's, we we can't do it. And so <laughs> we didn't do that. Never yeah. thinking you might be blowing your shot at uh, No, future. afterwards, the next morning, I woke <laughs> up like, oh, what did I do? Yeah. Uh, but, you know, I just always believe what it, it, you know, whatever, it's, it's, it'll be right, is right. And then there was a point where I was like, nothing was happening. I was like, I remember I was kind of was like, ah, I think I might just hang it up, give it up, go, go to law school or something. And uh, my friend Chauncey literally threw me on the ground, on the grass, and he said, you're 
not quitting this. You're doing this. You're doing it for us. You know? <laughs> and he, he really got on my face. And then I shook it off. And, you know, of course, my brothers were always, you know, like, what are you talking about, dude? You know, um, but then I, at some point I decided I'm going to stop playing out and I'm just going to go and I'm just going to try and like I had I, I started writing more songs and I'm like, I'm going to go and I'm just going to try and write the greatest album I can make. You know, and so I, I met this kid, Walt Vincent, outside of the Troubadour after a Sloan concert. And I think we were both having a cigarette and we just started bonding over Sloan, how blown away we were by that concert. And he's like, yeah, I got a little studio in the valley if you want to come out and hook up. And I didn't really think much of it. Uh, but one day I did follow up on that and I went and I saw him and I had I had previously recorded in my basement my friend jj who's on the cover of music for more after he's the one behind me walking okay. you could see his arm yeah he turned me on the pro tools he was like peen i got this pro tools and i'm like what is this pro tools we were always recording the tape and i thought this computer recording would be so nerdish i couldn't I couldn't fathom it and ended up being amazing and so we recorded we had recorded in my basement just drums bass and acoustic guitar of a song called Just Another. And I had that. And so I'm like, well, let me take it to this guy, Walt, in the valley and see what he can do to it on top of it. So I bring the files over there. And this is kind of where the like magic started happening. Uh, Walt, he plays these kind of fake horn strings over it, beautiful, like bringing out like the emotion on another level, you know. Um, he adds this harmonica that just felt like, you know, something from like, uh, you know, Midnight Cowboy, you know, and he burns me a CD and I go home and I'm driving in my car and I pull over and I'm just like, oh, I never heard, I never liked, I, I'm like, a lot, a lot of times I would previously I'd hear my voice or I'd hear my music. I'd be like, I know him. I know that. And this I heard, I was like, it came from another world. It wasn't me. It was like something, it was me, but it was something in it that I didn't recognize too well, but that I loved. And I remember that I pulled, literally pulled over and was like, holy shit. And I was like obsessed. I listened to it over and over again. And I was like, what? I got to work with this guy more. And so... I want to give Walt Vincent, I always do, but I want to remind the very big part of that like pre early music for the morning after sound and the, the pulling the emotion out of what, what I do and just making it to another level. Um, and he would capture my vocals in such a beautiful way. Um, just love that guy. But um, what happened was we recorded a few songs. So we, we recorded, we got Just Another, we dropped Black, Lose You. For Nancy. Uh, Nancy was with Ken Andrews. That was different. Oh. Um, I had Nancy written, but I recorded that in one day with Ken. Um, totally different sesh. But um, what happened was what we're getting at is at that point, I started floating some of those demos. I was able to get them to some people at Columbia Records, uh, Michelle Anthony being one of them. Um, and she liked it and she was able to get it to Donnie. And then they kind of, uh, wanted to fly me to New York from to hear more. So I had I, I get flown to New York to go into Donnie Einer's office and I with my acoustic guitar and one of those classic things like like you know like Donnie kid. I think was smoking a butt you know <laughs> he was like you know he's classic legendary guy and he's like he's like all right kid what do you got one of those moments and yeah. I'm like all right so I play just another girl acoustic I play Murray. And he's like, what else you got? And I probably played one other song. And he's like, all right, we'll let you know. Don't Nothing call us, we'll call you. Yeah, it was one of those. <laughs> and and it was one of those moments where you think, you know, it's like you think like you have these certain moments in your life that you got to nail, you know? And I was like, I did, I did what I did, but I flew home and I was kind of not hearing anything. And I'm like, well, you know, I kind of forgot about it. In that time period... Um, I don't know how much, I don't remember how much time had gone by. I, I heard that they weren't like pass, but it was like, you know, it's like, we're watching you, you know, we're watching you. Is this like months at this point or is it? I feel like it was maybe a few months. Um, but 
as luck would have it, this guy lived down the street from me, Tony Burr, a great producer. Sure. He would have all the young kids around. Like he would help them in the studio. He'd show them chords. He's like, dude, play it, write a song with this chord. Yeah. I'll help you record this. Just the best guy. And really like just, uh, just kind of help push artists along and develop them. He would turn me on to beautiful music that I'd never heard before and uh, expand, you know, my palette. And he did one day, he showed me a chord, which is a kind of, I don't know what it's called, but it's this like strange chord that's in Life in a Chain. And he said, go home and write a song with that chord. And I'm thinking, all right, Tony, you know, I'll write a song with the chord, whatever. Didn't think much of it, but I went home and later at night, probably after a few bong hits, I did. <laughs> I did write a song with that chord and it was Life in a Chain. And then I forget the time frame. I feel like it was within like a week or two. We get the call that they're sending a, an A&R guy named Will Botwin's going to be out on a trip in LA and he'd like to come see me if I got anything new, you know. And I'm like, yo, shit, yeah. So he actually comes to our house. And I remember we watched uh, like a Knicks playoff game. <laughs> and they won. That was good. We were all Knicks fans. And uh, and then we go down to the basement and he's like, let's hear some songs. I'm like, well, I wrote, I just wrote this one like a week ago or so. And I sit literally like closer than I am to you. Like I'm like right up in his face. I remember, I'll never forget this. And I play Life in a Chain. And that was, that was all it took. He heard that song and he said, dude, let's do this. He was, just, that was it. So I feel like Will, I feel like Will had the green light. Like if he, they trusted Will and he's a legendary guy too. Mm. And I feel like they probably said to Will, if you're feeling it, you know, do something, you know? And for me to, to, you know, to have the opportunity to record for Columbia Records, it was like, you know, Bruce, Dylan, you know. ACDC, Barbara Streisand. Yeah, it's everyone. just to it's, go all uh, over yeah. the place. It was like, you know, come on. That was like the the pinnacle. And also at a time where you really needed a record deal to get anywhere. It wasn't like you're putting yourself out, you know, on your own, you know. And so that was a 19, I feel it was like my birthday of 1999. I signed my deal with Columbia. The paperwork was done and we signed the deal, six album deal. Um, and it was a dream come true. You know, I was like floating the cloud nine. I was like, I'm on Columbia record. You know? But I was very, I was very for a youngster, I was at that point, I was 26. And I, so I was, wasn't that young. I was very clear in my head that like, okay, you got the deal. That's great. Don't fuck but you up. gotta, you're just buckling your seatbelt. You got a lot of work to do here. You gotta be on it. And, uh, me and Walt and we brought in Brad Wood went in and, and we had to finish the record, you know, and Brad, another wizard, you know, he was like, we, they're, cause right away when we got signed, they're like, okay, you're working with this guy. We don't even believe he's a real person or Walt <laughs> Vincent. You know, they had never even heard of him. Is he the drummer of Shark uh, Island? George Trecoulia still jokes. He's like, or Walt Vincent isn't a real person. <laughs> like, I'm like, dude, he's a real, very real person. It was and, the eighties uh, and nineties. Everyone had weird names. Ricky yeah. Rocket, R. Walt Vincent. Yeah. <laughs> well, he's Robert Walter Vincent. He's a great guy. But they were, they kind of were like, okay, could we balance it out with like a known producer name? And so like I met a bunch of producers. I flew to England and met with some producers. I met with Stephen Street. I met with this guy, uh, Robbie, who had produced um, like The Verve and Oasis because I loved Britpop, you know, sure. so much. And after I was like met all these guys, I was like, man, like, oh, we're on to something <laughs> in the valley in the little in the little little Black Widow guest house in the, on Van Nuys, <laughs> in Van Nuys. And so I was like sticking to that. And then somehow. I see Brad Wood's name in the hat and I research him a little bit. I'm like, wow, he's did great with all these debut records. Like he really has a good track record. But he said my favorite thing of any of the producers, Brad said he got the demos and he loved them, which the demos were the, a lot of the versions that made the record. He said, I love what you guys are doing. And I just, I don't want to even mess this up. I just want to help you guys, you know, just like any way I can, you know, he was like, everyone else was really heavy handed, like, oh, we got to redo it like this. And he was just like, got it. And uh, to his credit, he was right. And he knows he was right. And 
he's one of my great friends still and we brought him in and he he just added beautiful touches to things that no one else could have added as also well. we should talk about the fact that discovery process of music like to have an A&R guy come to your house and listen to song for the, watch basketball with you yeah. and then go to the basement and you play I mean, that doesn't really exist anymore everything's done through like TikTok and labels literally discover artists now straight through like TikTok yeah. so that doesn't happen anymore and to think about that was such a pivotal moment in your life write a chord he comes to your house again. Would never ever happen now. <laughs> oh yeah, it was all magic. It, it was all magical. Yeah, it was meant you know, to looking, be, looking back at it, it was like, it was it was crazy. And then and then to have success on the first record, pretty quickly was was what you know. I remember the agent that I picked to be my booking agent was this guy. At first, was this guy Don Muller because. I met with some people and they were like, oh, there's going to be this and this and this. And he was like, all right, here's the deal. You're going to be slogging out in a van for years. He just like gave me the hard reel of what it would be. And I was like, I like this guy. Let's go with this guy. And, uh, you know, luckily we were in, we were in a van for like one mini tour. And then all of a sudden it was bust. We were like, we were able to do a bus because we were, we were, we were growing fast, you know, in, in our little way. But, um, yeah, it was just... Uh, I think that record ended up going gold or platinum, right? It definitely did very well for you. Yeah, it did great. It did great. Yeah. And fast forward to the second record, you start working. We were talking about producers, like legendary producers, R.E.M., Peter Buck, started to work with you. You had Frank Black you work with. We touched base a little bit on Ken Andrews because I love Failure, and I think they're one of the most underrated bands of all time. I mean, when I was in L.A., I think it was like mid to late 90s they were performing a lot. And I used to go see them. I'm like, this band should be huge. They should be at Nirvana level. Yeah, like, they're really. I feel like they had a renaissance in the past. They did. Few I years. saw they them did... the, the other day. I saw them. Well, I don't know the other day. I saw them play whenever they played in L.A. Not long ago, and, and they're still great. But I don't know if they ever really got their their due. I mean, I feel like they should have been bigger than they were. But he's a great producer, by the way, an amazing artist. Ken's a great producer. I remember bringing for Nancy to him, and they had a whole another section that he just like just lopped off. He's like, no, there was this like kind of B section before each chorus. He's like, nope, you just go right to cause it already. Yes. I was like, okay. At first I was like, hmm. and then I heard it and I was like, yes, you're correct. Ken Andrews, that is the right move. <laughs> um, and he was really cool how he, he was the first time to bring, he brought like the 808 kick into it, like boom, 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 you know, things like that that I hadn't really had on my music before that really made it powerful. Like coming out of that last breakdown where it kind of like, it's almost like a DJ thing where it kind of, it goes like, you know, like yeah. that sort of thing. Excuse me. Um, but yeah. I love, I love the stories behind some of these songs. And that is one of my, I think one of my favorite songs for Nancy. What, what's the lyrical story behind that song? What was the inspiration behind that song? There's a real story behind that one. Some songs, some songs, some songs I don't have story. I don't remember. This one is, I remember very well where I, um, it's about, it's from, it came from me buying a new guitar. I, I went to black market music on La Cienica sure. again on La Cienica. It's right. That's not there anymore. And I, I traded a uh, Mose Wright that I didn't like for this uh, kind of burgundy SG, Gibson SG guitar. Uh, and it was like a straight trade. And I took the SG home. I sat on my girlfriend's bed. She was at work and literally wrote the song in five minutes. As long as it took to sing the song, it was written. Just magic. And What's her name, Nancy? No, I'll to tell you the answer. So I, I, I write it and I'm sitting there and I was like, and I record it on my little tape thing. And I was like, whoa. And I look at the guitar, I'm like, it's like a smoking gun. I'm like, and I noticed two things I didn't notice in the store in my rush to get out of there on the trade. One was that the headstock had broken and been glued on the back because there, there was like an airplane glue on it. And then on the back of the guitar on the body, the name Nancy was scrawled into it. Like it's just like a knife. And I said, you know, I don't know who this Nancy is, but it's for you. And that's why I called it for Nancy. Um, and yeah, it was a magical moment. Yeah, definitely. You, you go on to do incredible records, a slew of records, 2006, Nightcrawler. You work with Scarlett Johansson. And even how that record came about is interesting because we were talking about it a little bit outside. You didn't really know that Scarlett could sing when you approached her. You just ended up asking, to, do you want to collaborate? But I don't think you really knew if she was like a great singer at that point, right? I knew that she was a great character. And 
I my idea for the record did come from you know the Serge Gainsbourg, Bridget Bardot kind of you know aesthetic, and so I was like, who could who could play that part? And it was her and I happen to know her so that worked out you know that she was down for it I caught her at a good time where she was at the moment I didn't know she was actually wanting to get into music a bit but yeah I didn't the truth is until she showed up at the studio uh I didn't know if she could sing but I just knew she's so talented she'll pull she'll pull it off and if it didn't work then it didn't work um would have been a bummer if she that record sat in the can for (laughs) years before we put it out I was like because I was sitting on it and it was just you know what I shared it with some people and it just kept kind of come popping back up, popping back up. And it was people, our friends and people around us were really like, this record's awesome. Like, you should put, what are you doing with this? And so finally we were like, Let's, maybe you should put it out. And then, you know, like uh, Rhino, Warner Brothers was like super into it and it ended up doing really good for us, you know. Interesting um, enough, you went to France to kind of like launch it because you well, already had a profile was, there. That so. was what I said. I hear, I just feel like it could do well in Paris. And it was, it was, it's really hard actually for non French acts yeah. to break in France of, unless you're like really big pop stuff. And um, we had made this record before she put out Anywhere I Lay My Head. It was just sitting, we were just sitting on it. And uh, Relator was just a huge, it's still huge there. It's like if I look on my Spotify and you see, like your top like songs. songs like France is like that songs in every little town you never heard of, yeah. like playing more than like some of my songs in like, you know, towns in America. <laughs> it's wild. So is it do you think you'll revisit working with her? I know you worked with her a couple of years ago too, but do you think you'll go back to maybe another record with her at some point? She jokes every ten years uh, <laughs> that we will rear our head, but I don't know. We'll see. And you worked with so many great producers, as we were speaking about it. Talk to me about working with Frank Black, one of your idols, the Pixies, and we spoke a little bit about Peter Buck. I mean, those guys were guys you just idolized growing up. You probably never thought you'd get to work with them. Yeah. What was it like working with some of them, especially Frank Black, I guess? Frank was just like, you know, when sometimes you meet your people you look up to and they might not – live up to an expectation or you know he's one of he exceeded it he was so great to work with he taught me so much in the studio we sat down in a hotel room in salem oregon uh the night before we were recorded and uh he, I just kind of i played him some of the songs i was looking to do and he pushed me on some of the he's like well what is this what you want to say here is this what you want to say and i was like well it's kind of but it sounds good but i kind of want to say this and he pushed me on some of the lyrics to press them even more and it was such a great great experience to do that and uh i never ever thought that i can do that you know because i like once it's for a lot of times with me once it's set like i only see it one way and he's like he helped me kind of like develop ideas a little bit more which was which was cool and uh recording with him in the studio was just like he was very like pure about it like he's like like i would hear a harmony or so he's like no no it's just like it's like just your voice really loud and raw and just this rocking band behind it and he was adamant about that. And that's the sound of that record. And you could hear it's very yeah. powerful because of that. And, you know, it's very different than my other records where we do a lot of overdubbing and a lot of, uh, you know, flourishes that, that aren't on the record. But I think it, I think that it's a strong record because of that, because of what we didn't put on it. Definitely. Do you have a favorite way to record music now? You work with so many great producers. You know, you've been through a few different labels. You do acoustic shows, shows with the band. Is there a certain process to making music now that you really enjoy more than others do you like to layer instruments or you're into do you like to work with certain producers like what's your favorite way to make music these days after doing 10 years of i think this is your 10th record last year i love personally i love working at home studios um uh, or like a small little room you know if Mm. you have like a nice console fine but like home studios are great and i like i i tend to i like working with the producer who is also an engineer and uh musician and could add something to it as well uh i find that as if it's like a good combo for me because i play so much stuff too and i feel like it's 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 fun for us to be able to develop things together um i was always such a solitary writer back in the day where i would just kind of you know do it on my own night then it was nice for me to spread out 
and, you know, write with other people and see what that was like and let people collaborate more. And, and that's something that I enjoy a lot more now, you know, that I've done it the other way for so long. Um, but yeah, there's no one set way though. Well, let's talk about the new single, Someday, Someday. You just literally performed it this morning. So by the time this comes out, it's about a month later, but it had to be amazing to play that in Good Morning America. Yeah, that was cool. Yeah. Uh, they were so nice. And uh, I had me and my boy Johnny Pulaski on piano. Cool. And Josh Goodwin, he sang backing vocals, and he co-wrote the song with me and produced it and mixed it. He's so talented. And uh, we did it, and it was fun. It's good. And so is there no, are you working on a full length? Because actually last year you put out a record in Hawaii, but this year will there be a like, full length record that comes out too? Yeah, I'm kind of working on a couple things simultaneously. I'm working on a project with Josh, and i am also been working on a project with Jackson from Daywave. Sure. Which will kind of be like complete the trilogy of Hawaii, of, of uh, Caretakers Hawaii, yeah. Hawaii yeah. and the next, the next thing that will come from that. But... Um, I can't say timeline on any of it, but what I'm doing with with um, Josh and Someday is a lot more stripped back. Like it's kind of more just acoustic, uh, roots here, um, sort of that sort of exploration. And, uh, and the other stuff with Jackson is more kind of like the next progression that we've been developing over the last few years. And will there be more touring this year? You played last night in Brooklyn. Going to be some more acoustic yeah. gigs or more band gigs coming last out this year? Last night was at, was McKittrick. McKittrick, you know yeah. That's like, that's like 27th. Yeah. It's in town. Yeah. Yeah. But, um, the, the, I, I have, um, I have a, to put a band together for a Bottle Rock. I'm doing Bottle Rock oh, in, in May. It's a great festival. And uh, that looks like it's a crazy yeah. festival. It looks really good. Um, and we were supposed to play last year. And then I had this like health thing come up. So I had to cancel. But um, so I'm looking forward to playing it this year. But um, I think I'm going to put a band together for that. So we'll probably do some shows around that. I wouldn't be surprised. Um, and in between, I'll probably do like one-off things, you know, here and there. Fly-ins, fly-out. Do you prefer the solo shows? It takes a lot for me to leave my, my <laughs> yeah. two girls at home. My three I'm girls, sure. now I got a little dog. Oh, ah, amazing. Uh, right. You know, I, 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 uh, I love being uh, home with them. Yeah, I get uh, it. But yeah, I feel like get out, you know, go go out and play some shows here and there. Do you prefer the solo shows, the band shows at this point? I like both, but I do want to, in a, in, a, in a quick kit, I do love just like whipping up, you know, acoustic show. I love the, I love the intimacy of the acoustic show and the dynamic that I can create and how I could just, there's no set list with that. I could just kind of do whatever I want. My repertoire is so, so many songs that it's, um, it's really fun for me, and I have to keep it fun. Uh, but rocking out with a band's fun too. So the next gig in LA, I'm definitely there. Well, we do these top five lists that kind of go viral, and people debate these forever. Oh yes. So we're going to start to get into this with you. And uh, I guess the first one we'll approach here is your top five Smith songs of all time, because I feel like you're a huge Smith fan and uh, a band that you love and a big inspiration for you growing up. So if you had to tell me, Pete Yorn, your top five Smith songs. All right, I just have to do the caveat. Five. I mean, it could change any day, yeah. you know, whatever. But I'll say this isn't an order, but unlovable. Uh, there's a light that never goes out. Um, heaven knows I'm miserable now. Paint a vulgar picture from Strange Ways Here We Come. Just the lyrics are insane. They're such a great, great song. If you had to pick a number one Smith song, then what no, would that be? Oh, my God. I know they're all... A boy with a thorn in his side. Number uh, one for you. Uh, uh, that's my fifth one in this list. And we of those five, I will say, I'll say that one. Okay. Well, great band, great choices. Uh, let's talk about top five artists for you that should have been bigger than they were. Or most underrated artists, I God, guess. I don't have five of those. I don't <laughs> even like to. Um, let's see. Oh, one band from Minnesota. They're not a band anymore. They're called The Hang Ups. They have a record called So We Go. It's Every song is great. I haven't heard them. Oh, so good. Um, Sloan, very big in Canada, but never really broke here. But awesome band. Good and a lot of band. your history, by the way, because that's where you met Walt. So. That's right. Yeah. Uh, Number three. Guided by Voices. They're plenty big, but yeah. they just they should be like as big as Billie Eilish. You know what I mean? They're, they're that good. <laughs> um, Number two for you. Uh, let's see. Um, 
Benji Hughes. He was a singer from North Carolina. He has a song that some people might know from like the last episode of Eastbound and Down. Sure. It's like, Kenny, do you want to decide? I forget what it is. He just has this beautiful, smoky voice. He's really talented. Um, He's got a lot of beautiful songs, Benji Hughes. And uh, And number one for you. uh, Not number one. I'll say Chapter House, their obscure Britpop band. They had a song called Pearl. It was beautiful, Um, very influential, melt melodically. and uh, there was a, another Britpop band called Adorable. It has a song called Sunshine Smiles. Great single, like really fun. Honorable mention. Yeah. <laughs> and last but not least, because obviously you just were in Kills of the Flower Moon. You have a connection to film. And now, who knows, there might be a whole other career as an actor for you. Your top five film soundtracks of all time, according oh, to Pete Yorn. Okay. Uh, Rocky won, you know. Going the distance, the you know the Bill Conti score is just unbelievable. It's a score, but sure. it's a it's a it's powerful. Um, Valley Girl, great soundtrack. Um, I'll throw Pulp Fiction in there. That was like in college. That was a yeah. great soundtrack. A lot of good stuff. This is never came out as far as I know as an actual soundtrack, but if soundtrack, but if they did put all the songs together, it'd be insane. It's the movie Shampoo, sure, Warren Beatty movie. Yeah, it opens up with. Uh, with the Beach Boys, it wouldn't it be nice? It's got uh, um, it's got Lucy in the Sky with Diamonds at the party scene. It's got Manic Depression, Jimi Hendrix at the party scene. It has all this beautiful score by Paul Simon. Um, it's unbelievable. Someone should c- put that together as a compilation. If it's not, um, and maybe number one for you. Yeah. I, are, are we at number one? I think <laughs> we're then, number one. I think. And then I said Valley Girl. You said Valley Girl. Got the yeah. plimsolls yeah. in there. It's a lot of that stuff. And then this one I'm gonna throw in because I was looking through my phone. I was like. I had, you know, some of these kids soundtracks are amazing. And I had so much fun with my little daughter uh, when when we watched this movie a lot. We would listen to this music all the time. But the Moana soundtrack wow. was great. It has You're Welcome and it's shiny. It has a lot of great songs. And uh, I'll just drop that in there. The yeah, Moana soundtrack. It. It's your list. You can yeah. do whatever you want. Well, this was a pleasure. We have to do part two at some time. I know you're a busy guy. And, you know, check out the new music. Check out Pete Yorn on tour. Go to all things Pete Yorn. Such a pleasure to see you, brother. Great to see you. Thanks for having me. Always fun.